Hi there, Mike Moran again with Communications 395. This is the second interview series that we had. In issue one, we had uh, Dylan Doty and Brianna Thomas from Gordon Thomas Honeywell talking about how they became lobbyists. Today, my guest is a person I've known for a number of years and I've worked with closely on a variety of issues, both in politics and in lobbying. Melissa McCabe Gomboski is from Spokane, Washington originally, undergraduate at Whitworth, graduate at Whitworth as well or Eastern? Do you have a master's in teaching? No, I just have a bachelor's degree in English from Whitworth a few years ago. And Melissa has worked for the Mead School District for a number of years. She transitioned out of that into lobbying and today we're going to talk about that basic topic and doing one example of how I got this job. So we'll walk you through your career and we'll also talk about some of the things that you've learned over the years and some of the questions I've asked everybody involving have they worked with both local, state, and federal. I know for you example you have a lot of work with Spokane City and County on water issues mm -hmm. and, and then just kind of how the, how the skills have gone on. With the class as we've talked all the way through this, I'm not teaching political science. I'm teaching in political science, the fact that we're dealing with civics and politics, but we're really talking about the communication strategies and methodologies we all use to do this job. So, as they say in every interview program, Melissa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for having me. And um, what is particularly special to be participating with you in this class is because you were one of my very first debate coach. And then I went on to coach debate at Mead High School and married a I met my husband in your class, so thank you. It's particularly um, nice. It's been a mixed blessing. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. But go ahead and tell the class. So I come, came to lobbying, I think, in a very unconventional way. I think my story is different than almost anyone that, that you talk to in, in the legislature and the lobbying in the third house world. Um, I was a teacher for 10 years, and um, my husband's job, but had been involved in politics, um, had been very involved with the teachers' union and electing our... Um, a local legislative delegation in Spokane. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask okay. you to help help the class here. What is the third house? The third house is the professional organization of lobbyists. And I'm sure you've probably talked about this already. There are a few types of lobbyists. There are in-house lobbyists who lobby just for uh, one organization, like the Dentists Association or um, the Trial Lawyers Association. In contract lobbyists, uh, lobby for a variety of clients and generally specialize in one or two policy areas. The third house represents us all and functions as a uh, trade association. Yeah, as a trade association of lobbyists. Okay, thank you. Continue. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I had been involved uh, at, for, with the Washington Education Association and just uh, in local politics and my husband's job moved us to Olympia uh, and I should also say that my husband ran for the legislature and so I was involved as a, a campaign spouse which I and a, he was elected and won and um, served in the house for seven years and I think that gave me a really unique view into the caucus into the, the mind of a legislator and you know I sat with lobbyists at dinners as my husband was being lobbyist I lobbied I got to see their behavior when they weren't interacting with a public official, but I, I had got to view who they really were. And for the classroom's benefit, we're speaking about Jeff Gomboski, who was a House member from the 3rd District of Spokane and served and finished his career as the Chairman of the House Finance Committee. Continue. Yes, and I, he was at that time the youngest member of the House, and not the youngest member ever. I think that was, was Denny Heck, yeah. who was our current congressman, but the you know, very young member. Uh, we moved to Olympia when my husband left the house and took a job uh, lobbying for Eastern Washington University and I stayed home with our children for a couple of years until I was completely crazy and then I was offered a, um, a basically an admin position at a, another trade association called Pharma which is Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. They're a nationwide organization. They're a national organization, um, one of the biggest federal and state lobbying organizations at, at least at that time. I mean I think some of their issues have been settled and they've they're moved out of the the spotlight now I think it's oil. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they were there was a lot of uh, tension on uh, pharmaceutical issues. So, are you, you were an employee, a farmer, or a contractor who ran an office for them? I was an employee in a two-person office. I worked for the the Northwest Regional Director, um, and I did everything from make coffee and copies to by the time I was leaving, 
I was interacting with lobbyists and helping communicate with um, the policy shop and the attorneys back in Washington, D.C. And just had a wonderful view of uh, national lobbying and, and large campaign giving and dinners and um, just a real interesting view of the political world that I had not seen. And then I was ready to, to move on to a more um, independent professional role. Uh, so a longtime lobbyist and former Speaker of the House, Joe King, who's sort of a legend in Southwest Washington and in the Washington Legislature, uh, offered me a job monitoring committees and, and just doing all the not very fun lobbying work. So I wrote reports and um, tracked bills and did all the things that he did not want to do. Let's talk about that for a minute because okay. in the class when we were talking about the communications, you know, there are, you know, and, you know, like my career, your career predates social media. But, yes. But in, the, but in the old days, and Dylan Doty in our first interview talked about, and I'm sure I've seen you and I do the same thing, the day starts often when you go to the, to the Legislative Information Center and you grab a sheaf of papers mm -hmm. and you thumb through the sheaf of papers even though it's all on tablets and computers. But we often are still a paper-driven business. So walk me through a day when you were with Pharma and then now as a contractor. When I was with Pharma, we had two lobbyists in, well, we had five states. So we had a regional director that had lobbyists in, in those five states. In Washington, we had two lobbyists. And so I would, we would get information from the lobbyists. We would take that information, pass it to the folks in Washington, D.C., all of those bills. They would tell us were being introduced. And the attorneys would read all of the bills and we would get information back about if there were any legislation being proposed that concerned us, pass that information on to the lobbyists, those lobbyists would then communicate with the legislature. And how's that different from today when you're, when you're doing your job as a contract lobbyist on your own? Well, I don't have staff to send bills to and I don't have attorneys to review generally as much, so I do a lot of that on my own. Um, now I look every morning at what bills have been introduced on something called the introduction sheets and it feels like drinking from a fire hose there are i think there were uh, two thousand bills this session introduced. 20, 24 something were introduced the governor signed under 300 this year it's the lowest number of governors signed in the history of the state in recorded time yeah so even though it, there was a low number of new bills that passed we still i still had to look at all 2400 titles and bills to determine if they would impact my clients. And so if I saw something that I thought uh, would concern my client in Spokane around water issues, I would send those to that client. They would review and let me know if there was anything we needed to engage on. And if there was something of large concern, I talked to those clients about strategies and then I'd get to work letting our local delegation know Senator so-and-so introduced this bill that would adversely hurt our business and can you please help? Let's, I'm gonna, uh, when we talk about how, how you do the job, I think what we'll do is uh, let's talk a bit about Spokane and the water issue we both alluded to. I'll try to summarize it. Spokane has a, has a primary secondary sewage treatment plant that's on the river, uh, down river from downtown. And the Department of Ecology has been issuing a whole series of regulations regarding uh, we'll just stick with phosphates as okay. one example. And your job was to man work on this, and, and you represented at this time on this problem. I still do. Inland Empire Paper Company. So we're a 100-year-old um, company that is a single family, owns in Spokane. We have 120 jobs organized by steel workers. Uh, I think the company is Spokane's second highest taxpayer, so a, a very significant employer in Spokane almost all my work is centered around the pipe that they have in the river that is highly regulated by the Department of Ecology as it should be because we want to make sure that that what the company is anything putting into the river is, is clean and doesn't do anything to harm the ecology of the, of the water. So we work with ecology to make sure that the, the testing and the permits are all in order. So let's now drop over the overlay on that, the, 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 the pollution limitation regulations and the stakeholder groups that you've had to contend with. Yeah, large um, number of stakeholder groups. So uh, um, anyone who's discharging into the river, so we, those are called point, point source dischargers. dischargers. 
So I think there are six in Spokane, so a couple private, Inland Empire Paper, Kaiser Aluminum, also the City of Spokane, the, uh, the County of Vista Utilities. Um, we also have uh, the Riverkeeper, who is the lead uh, conservationist that um, is the lead for the environmental community. Um, we have an organization, the Sierra Club. Um, KELP, Center, Center for Environmental Law and Policy, yes. Rachel Pascal Osborne. Yes. And they all, have a, they all have a different level of view of perfection, don't they? They do. Yes, we also have um, uh, three tribes, four tribes that have engaged. Spokane, Kalispell, Colville, uh, Colville Port d'Alene. Um, so the tribes have been less involved, but certainly consulted by the governor. I mean, it, they're, they're, you can speak to this better than I can if they're um, very concerned about water quality and it's a rich part of their heritage. So I do the best that I can to reach out to those tribal representatives, um, but we, I, we work with, with everyone. Does, does your employer client in this case work as part of the coalition on, on the water issue? We do. So in the past, like on the phosphorus issue, there were just a bunch of fighting. So number, I think 15 years of lawsuits, millions of dollars. We always say the river didn't get clean and a bunch of lawyers got rich. So the Spokane stakeholders all got smart and said, okay, so even though kelp sues my client in Linen Pirate Paper and they're suing the Department of Ecology and, and this, Rather than have all of that litigation, why don't we sit down at the table and see if we can work something out to to clean to improve the quality of the river and avoid any litigation? Um, and so we have formed the Spokane River Regional Toxic Task Force, and that group has attempted to uh, get along and to make. Um, progress towards cleanup. Right now they're working on PCB, which is very difficult um, contaminant to clean. And it's going well. So we're three years into the process. One of all of those stakeholders has not agreed to sit down at the table, and that is led by Kelp and uh, Rachel Pascal Osborne. And she sued the, she's actually sued the Department of Ecology, mm -hmm. saying you have to have uh, what we're calling a TMDL, or total maximum daily load. And uh, Ecology and EPA and the judge said, no, as long as you're making measurable progress, you can try this new stakeholder process. And it's, I think it's fabulous. It's, it's a new way of um, stakeholders working together and it's worked well. I've, you know, I've, I've never said it in a class before. It's probably the first time I've said it publicly. There are a lot of times when people use litigation as a lobbying strategy. Yes. In essence, it's a pincer movement. Uh, if they can get a judgment, they can return to the legislature and say, we have this judgment that says that you're not going far enough. In the most basic of explanations, that explains McCleary, which is yeah, a group exactly. of plaintiffs go to the court, uh, and then the court is in the pl pl place of an arbiter. Um, so as you've gone, you've been doing this now, my goodness, you've been doing this over 10 years, almost 20. Um, this, this is our, uh, uh, my, I think it was my 18th session, either as a legislative spouse or somehow involved. This is my seventh year directly lobbying. Oh, okay. So I, when I left Farm, I started with one client, and then I always joke that I got the, the scraps that fell off the table from the Joe King or the, the more experienced lobbyist, but now I have, I think, six clients on my own, and I've tried to stay in two policy areas. One's environmental regulation. Mm -hmm. So I also represent all the uh, cosmetic companies, and then the other is um, education because I have K twelve background. It's it's. In, I was going to talk to you. That, you know the textbooks I showed you at the beginning of the class. The students have. You know, there's this constant word called trust. I mean, mm -hmm. legislators have to trust the lobbyists. The lobbyist has to trust trust the legislator. The client has to trust have trust in the process. But I, I was going to ask you also. You know, you talked about getting the scraps, but quite candidly. Um, success begets success. I mean, mm -hmm. you've, you've picked up clients basically because you are competent. I mean, before we started, you know, your husband, uh, Jeff Kabowski said, well, you're still in it, aren't you? Meaning, if you're succeed, you know, it is, mm -hmm. we, uh, we are, if, lobbies are ducks. I mean, you know, they're very smooth on top, above the water, but they may be paddling mm -hmm. furiously below. Um, to wrap up our segment, what I, I wanted to, I wanted to go back briefly and say, you've watched legislators and lobbyists in social environments and, um, I think it's perhaps one of the most misunderstood phenomena 
Uh, mm -hmm. There's always this assumption that this is uh, untoward. My experience as a lobbyist, and I don't entertain much because of the clients I've had, but my understanding is that legislators generally only want to go have dinner with people that they like. I don't think it's always been a matter of who can I, who do I don't like and who do I have to have dinner with. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you briefly peek in your past and into your head, because you often probably had to schedule all these things. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> how, you know, walk, make the case for, uh, for entertainment. Why do legislators need to have dinner with lobbyists and or with business organizations? Why can't they do it in 15 minutes? Oh, I, it's about, it's about relationships and building trust. I, I'm a, I, I really don't think that there's anything wrong with a lobbyist or an organization paying for someone's dinner. I could talk forever about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look, we recently have had um, new uh, PDC has, uh, we have new rules about yeah. when we can retire. For the class, it's, it's 12 meals a year. Um, I had a different, I had more of a Weight Watchers approach. <laughs> I feel if you've gained 20 or 30 pounds, then you should probably stop going out to dinner. <laughs> and as a guy who was once 450 pounds, I can speak from a limited amount of experience. But, but continue. I think that in a 15 minute meeting, if I'm speaking on behalf of an education client and I tell a legislator X, Y, and Z is true, they, I'm gonna, might give them a one pager and a bunch of facts and information, they might digest that quickly. And those, that legislator is seeing someone every 10 or 15 minutes. And then when they go to the bathroom, someone is literally, literally walking them from their office to the bathroom and lobbying them on another issue. So they are busy, lots of information. What having a dinner or a lunch or a walk around the lake, which I've done, just having more time, allows me to develop a relationship and say to that legislator, I was a teacher for 10 years, here are the, cl the classes that I taught, here's what I candidly thought about the education system, I'm a mom, here are the experiences my children have had and learn about that person. When I come into their office the next time on 15 minutes, they know, oh, Melissa knows what she's talking about, or I listen to her and I don't, I don't agree with you know, how she sees the education system, or it just allows uh, for a, a better relationship and for better facilitation of information. Is there a difference between lobbying, say, Mike Moran from the 22nd District, who is a member of the Appropriations Committee but not in leadership, versus Frank Chop, the current Speaker of the House? I mean, do, do those meetings take on a different cast or, um, or complexity, or is it often just making sure that at least 50 people in the House and 25 people in the Senate are, are understanding where you are coming from and will hopefully help you. So a difference with, I don't get very many meetings with Frank Chapa, as I think most lobbyists don't anymore. That's just something that's unique about the Speaker of the House's personality. Mm -hmm. When I do, it takes a bit to schedule and I haven't been in his office for more than five minutes in the last five years. But there, again, there's some trust built because of past relationship with him. I'll ask another question. In your practice, do you find that if, if you know that members are on your side of the page regarding the issue that you're working on, uh, that there seems to be amongst practitioners a need to constantly talk to their friends at all times versus, and I'm, I'm of this school, which is that um, I don't pester members if I know where they are. Exactly. I, may, I may touch them in the hallway or, or meet them outside the doors and, and check in, but generally speaking, um, if a member needs to talk to me and if it's uh, and, and or if my clients in trouble um, I usually get the call I'm told to come and and, and I'll, I'll ask you this as a story and then we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit so tell me the first time when you got a call saying I need to see you Melissa oh that's great what time right now and it, and pick whatever member whatever story you want to take without naming names <laughs> Does I, it, I remember being fear? in my pajamas watching you know LA Law or whatever show I was watching at home in my pajamas getting a call at 10:45 at night and it was around uh, I was representing a transit agency at that time we were just trying to get some like a car tab and we had passed through the house we were almost in the Senate but the chair um, Mary Margaret Haugen did not like it and I got the call to come in and basically she just waved her finger at me and, and uh, so that's one of my favorite stories because I was frightened of her mm -hmm. out of great respect for her. And um, so, yeah, that, that time. I think, yeah, that also goes back to the hum people forget this is a conversation business. And so, you, you know, I've, I've often been amazed. I don't know what you feel about it when people storm away from a meeting 
and because the legislator doesn't agree with them that that there's now hatred it's like no they just don't agree with you, you know? and, that's right um but uh, but there are members that that we both know that have been in the in the house and senate and are still there who also at times just exhibit what my wife would call bear-like behavior mm -hmm. they want to chew and growl at you and, and then they're done and then five minutes later they're happy again um, as you go through this career and if you've got your children are getting ready for college you have one graduating already or soon he's 17 and he has we held him back a little. I always say I redshirted him academically mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've got two more years yeah well my wife would observe that boys develop intellectually slower than girls and that all boys should be held back a year, but that. Right well, it was good. He started in kindergarten, but he and I would say he's already been a page. He's mm -hmm. scheduled for us, so he's he was on the floor of the house when he was two months old. So he's been raised there. So, what advice if we have college students that are taking this class? Most of the students who take this class are are in some sort of organizational behavior discipline. Some are going to be pastoral assistants. Some are going to be working in nonprofits. Others are in business. Some are in political science. If somebody wanted to get into this line of work, particularly given your path from teaching to lobbying, mm -hmm. what would what would you tell them? I would say take any any job that you can get. I mean, I started by making copies um, in a political organization and no, nothing is beneath you. Um, one of the very best lobbyists who works for Carney Badley, makes lots of money, has a slew of clients. I watch him organize. He'll, there's no task that's too small for him. Um, I would say relationships are really important. Be a person of your word. Work really hard. I mean, all the things that make would make you successful in any. And my last question, your opportunity to comment is, um, are you of the generation like I that often will write handwritten notes back to members for thank yous and and are, do you find email is and texting? I mean, there's email. There, nowadays, there's especially uh, you watch Twitter feeds of members and they they snark at each other via Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the days before, you would be told that harsh opinion and confidence. But now, of course. You don't have to ask about it because in 15 minutes, a member is going to say, so and so is a stupid head, hashtag pass taxes now, or hashtag stop taxes now. And I mean, have you, are you finding that being uh, a, a, a problem, a, an issue, or do you try to ignore it? The causticness it? Of, yeah. of social media. I just try to stay out of it. I mean, there's no upside for me to ever have a legislator upset with me or to take a partisan position. I mean, I take the position of what my client is asking me to do, but. There's no, there's always, if, if I'm disagreeing with you on a certain issue tomorrow, there might be an issue that we need to work together mm -hmm. on. And I work really hard to separate the personal relationship from the policy. I don't always do a good job. I, I go home and I, you know, complain to my family about it and I, you know, take things personally, but at the end of the day, you have to set it aside. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to get the class to uh, to get a feel for how people do this job because yeah. it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, kids. It's not the West Wing. Thank you very much <laughs> for listening. <laughs>